Blessed be your name.
you're rich in love. You're rich in love, and you're slow to anger. Your name is great, and your heart is kind. Oh,
Oh, my God. 
Glory fills the highest place. 
face Why can that believe me now? At the cross At the cross I bow my knee Where your blood was shed for me There's no greater love than this You have overcome the grave Glory fills the highest place
talking, I don't know much bigger he was, but I'm sure a lot bigger than David was. He didn't run away from Goliath, did he? What did he do? He ran toward him and he dealt with that problem. He dealt with it based on and he overcame it. So I encourage you all to do that. Um, but put the Lord in it. Allow him to do it. We can't do it on our own human strength. With that being said, let's join me with uh, Weapon Brother Wills. He comes up to continue with the series of Facing the Giants and Spirits of Church and Transformation. As we welcome up the kids, and we'll go ahead and pray for the kids, and we'll go ahead and meet and greet after that. So we're getting all the kids up here. opportunity to, to have children uh, amongst us, God, that, uh, that we would always be uh, welcoming and receiving to them and uh, reach out to them, God, that we would protect them, that we would protect their ears and their eyes and everything that they see and hear, God, that, that we would just give them good things, Lord, and that they would be a blessing, that we would be a blessing to them as they have been a blessing to us, that we'd be patient with these children, God, that we would just be endearing and encouraging and always trying to put a word of truth in them to build confidence, to build strength. To know, Lord God, that they are the next generation, and that we should uh, invest in them, and they're worth our time. Please put a hedge of protection around these children, God. Build them up in stature and in spirit. We pray for your blessings now in the name of our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Say another quick prayer. Heavenly God, we just uh, thank you for bringing us here. I thank you for the uh, the enthusiasm of the people. Thank you for the community uh, and the clo- coming together. And uh, I pray we continue to lift each other up, God, and uh, unite together as a people. I just ask for your blessings now that uh, your word would minister to the people, God, that your word and your spirit would, God, would, uh, would open the hearts of the people, that they would open their ears, that they have uh, eyes and ears to hear and see God, and that their hearts would be able to perceive what the spirit of God is telling Thank you for this time, God, as we ask for your Holy Spirit now to be in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome, guys. Thank you for coming. It's been, a, it's been an eventful day, so I'm happy to be here. <coughs> Excuse me. Got a little something stuck. Well, let's... Uh, Anyway, let's look at where uh, where we've been and where we're headed to. So over the past few weeks, we've been uh, uh, preparing ourselves, really, as a church and as a, as a body of believers. Uh, that's why we did the studies on uh, and preparing us so that God could begin to minister to us and do, and do a work in us and through this ministry. Amen. And so we've mentioned how we, uh, we did a series before, uh, a three-part series on the power of God about the power of prayer and that helps us stay connected to God. And we can't do this unless we, we hear from God so we know what areas in our life he wants to do work in. We need to have the power of faith that we spoke about in the second week of the series. That even if we don't know where we're going or where God's leading, that we have the faith just to kind of, just to, just to follow through. Okay. And we also knew we couldn't rely on our own wisdom and our own strength, but we needed the power of the, of the Holy Spirit to allow us to make it through this long journey. And that prepares us. And then last week we began about uh, speaking of a series of spiritual transformation, that uh, by living in this corrupted world, we're influenced by it. And it, it, it molds and shapes us, whether for good or for bad. And this culture is, is something, that's, uh, something that's bringing us down and, help, uh, and hurting us as a people. It's not building us up anymore. And we're called to be salt and light to this earth and to this world. And we're told that we're not part of this world. We're, we're of a different people. We're an alien uh, to this nation, to this world. Okay. So we want to grow. We want to change. We want to transform spiritually and personally. Now, that's where we've been. And where we're headed to is now that we have a foundation as to uh, we want to grow and there's a need to grow spiritually to transform and to personally uh, develop. We had asked you guys, you know, about prayer requests. So that as we get prayer requests in, we have an idea as to what the people are struggling with, what the people are dealing with, so that each week, you know, we, we're able to minister to the people. So as we go through week by week in the next couple of three weeks that we have in the series, we're going to be dealing with different topics that help us grow as a people, to help us transform. Last week, uh, Abe came up and he, and he said, you know what, we want you guys to make a commitment. You know, one of the things I wanted you guys to do is ask God, you know, what area in your life are you, uh, is he ministering to you on? What area in your life are you trying to grow in? And then write it down, put it in your Bible, put it next to your bedside. And not just hear a sermon or, or, or read a scripture verse, but say, you know what, I'm going to take this walk seriously. I want to transform me more and more like Christ. I realize that I'm being negatively, negatively affected by this culture. Where do I need to change? Where has the culture molded me in a way that I shouldn't be, that God hasn't called me out to be in this place? Amen. How close to Sodom and Gomorrah have I walked? Mm. Help. <coughs> so take that challenge. Commit something to the Lord and say, okay, you know what? This is an area I feel God's talking to me on that I need to grow and change in. And as you have prayer requests, put them in there, whether it's on the scroll or a piece of paper. I want to pray for you guys. We want to pray for you guys. I want to give out some of these prayer requests to, to different people to pray. And that'll help the transformation process. If you're not growing, they say you're dying, right? So that's where we've been. That's where we're headed. So tonight, we'll be discussing 
topic of pride. This is another foundational area that we all need to deal with. It is the linchpin of most people, both great and small. They say that pride comes before the fall, and history has certainly proven that to be true. The Bible's filled with heroes of faith and others who have fallen on or disappointed God because of pride. From Adam and Eve to Abraham, Moses, David, to the New Testament with Peter, the apostles, and the Pharisees. We see it. We see it in modern day history and contemporary news today. We see horrific consequences of pride. War, greed, divorce, everything. Fighting in the playgrounds, in the neighborhoods, division amongst churches, families and friends, organizations and so on. Ripped apart, usually because of pride. In Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And that's where we get the saying, pride comes before the fall. We lift ourselves up, and by nature we fall. Amen. We lift ourselves up, God has to humble us. We humble ourselves, God lifts us up. It's almost like a rule of nature. Amen. If you brag to your friend, your friend criticizes you or rags you down. You're humble to your friend, he wants to lift you up. Amen. So I want to ask you guys a few questions. Have you ever gotten into a disagreement with a friend or a spouse? And you think, they're wrong. But they won't listen to you. They seem to get huffy and fold their arms, walk away. You leave thinking, man, they're stubborn. All that. You ever get angry with someone or a group and say, I'm done with them? I'm not going to talk to them anymore. I ain't ever going back to that place. Well, that waitress, she was so rude. And that guy is such a jerk. Where did that idiot get his driver's license from? You totally just throw somebody under the bus because they apparently did something to you. Apparently. <clears throat> Have you ever been offended? And feel your heart shut off to somebody? Yes. You can see it physically too. Body tenses, you fold your arms, you feel like I can't trust them anymore. What does that do? A little brick of separation. It's like there you go. You hurt me and I don't trust you as much, so you got a little brick. And if you're with that person a lot, you get another little brick. Another little break. And maybe it's somebody else, but it reminds you of that first break. So there goes another couple of breaks, you know. And before you know it, you got this wall of separation. Because you got to protect the heart. And now there's a division. The intimacy that you have with that friend, not, not the same anymore. But it's okay. You rationalize it. You move on. And nice to see you, brother. That's not how God intended it. And you know it's going to affect your relationship with the Lord. You can't be hard-hearted here and not be hard-hearted there. So this is what happens when pride enters in. It's full of judgment and it divides. So we all have a stake at needing to learn more about pride. How it causes so much trouble in our lives. How it operates and stumbles us. What it looks like. And what can we do about it? So it doesn't continue to wreak havoc in our lives and our communities. We all got the same issue. We all got to deal with pride. And it's not just one thing. Pride is foundational. When I say it's a linchpin, it causes trouble in so many areas of our lives. Spiritual growth mm -hmm. really is halted by this pride. Yeah. And we're going to see this tonight in two big areas. Really, I didn't even know where I was going with the study when I started. I just knew it had to be about pride. Of course, you teach on something, boy, do you get hammered on it. And that was my whole day today, from beginning to end so far. And I have to practice what I preach. You know, it's easy to say in theory, it's like, oh, wait a second. Don't try to deal with your consequences and the trees and try to change everything. What are you supposed to learn about this personally and spiritually? Boy, that helped me a lot. I took a walk during work and I had a 
boom. It's like everything in the study just started coming out, and I had to preach to myself. Amen. <laughs> but it helped me through it. It helped me through it, gave me my confidence back. So we're going to talk about two areas. Old Testament, we're going to talk about David and Goliath. And we're going to look at it a little bit differently. We're going to look at it from a perspective of pride. And then at the end, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ and his battles with the Pharisees. Amen. The antidote to pride, the opposite of pride, humility. And we're going to learn the power behind humility. One of my favorite sayings was, there's victory in surrender. There's victory in surrender. Let that sink in. So, if you have a Bible, we're not going to go verse by verse, but you can look at 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to kind of summarize a little bit of the story of David and Goliath. Most of you know it. You've heard it, whether as a child. And I'm just going to kind of try to paint the picture. And so just try to imagine, imagine what's going on. So Goliath is a giant over nine foot tall. All right, big guy. He's wearing what seems like an impenetrable armor that included a bronze helmet, a 200 pound full body armor, and carrying a thick javelin with a 25 pound iron spearhead. So imagine the tip of it weighing 25 pounds. Very intimidating. So much so that the army of Israel hid from him when asked for a one-on-one -on -one fight. The victor will rule and enslave the loser. A lot at stake. Then we have the little shepherd boy David coming to the scene. Small kid, full of gumption, fearless. He fought lions when he was young. He says he will take on the giant because God is bigger. Amen. <laughs> Any VeggieTale fans want to sing that song? My wife's like, yeah. God is. Yeah. He says that he will take on the giant because God is bigger than any giant. Amen. We know that David was skilled with a sling. He takes a smooth stone, a solid smooth stone, and hurls it at the giant, hitting it right between the eyes causing the invisible giant to fall flat on his face, right onto the ground. Then David takes Goliath's own sword and cuts off his head, killing the giant. And we know the basic lessons that we get from the story of David and Goliath, that God, with God all things are possible, that we need to have faith and not fear, that God can use anybody to accomplish his will, no matter how big or small, no matter how smart or not, no matter what your skills or talents are, if God is behind you, there's nothing to fear. God just needs a willing vessel Amen. to accomplish his will. But there's a lesson here about pride too. And it offers us a nice illustration. You've heard the saying I mentioned, pride comes before the fall. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But look at what Goliath can represent. Look at the pride. He's gigantic in size. His armor is impenetrable. His weapons incomparable to David's little sling. He's confident and arrogant. What's he say in verse 36? Then the Philistine said, the, the giant, this day I defy the armies of Israel. He's arrogant. He's intimidating. Goliath sees himself as greater than anyone from Israel's army. He looks down at them as cowards. He says in verse 42, he looked David over and saw that he was a little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. And he said to David, am I a dog that you come with me, come at me with sticks? And the Philistine giant cursed David by his, by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Let me get my hands on you. You're nothing compared to me. Our giants sometimes seem so big and invincible. And when we're full of pride, we feel the same way. I'm right. I'm smarter. I'm bigger. I'm prettier. We lift ourselves up and we put the other down. And that sets us up for failure. That sets us up for sin. 
But that's what our pride does. I'm more important. What I have to say should be listened to. Pride compares you with others. It criticizes the others. It separates people. It creates division. It says it's you versus me. It's full of judgment. You're not good enough. I'm better. It puffs you up and puts them down. And what happens? It leads to fighting. It leads to wars. Division. That's mine. I deserve it, not you. Why did he choose her? Why didn't I get that award? I go on and on. He doesn't have this. My car, my house is better. My shoes are better. My kids are smarter than your kids. My team is so much better than yours. And so it goes on and on until nobody's united. There's no harmony. No agreement to anything or anybody. We fight pride with humility. In Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. So that's David, excuse me, that's Goliath. Let's look a little bit about David and what he represents. He's not a warrior. He's a little shepherd boy. The youngest in his family. Does he come delivering military goods and support? No, just some food. He's often overlooked by everyone. No special position, no special job, no special education, no special training. He can't even fit into the military armor. He has no impressive weaponry, just a little sling. He's nothing to be confident about. He's by far not seen by the army, by Israel's army or King Saul as anybody's savior. And he's certainly seen as no match for Goliath. In fact, Goliath sees him as a cute little boy the size of a stick and he's literally insulted that this is all you offered to fight me? He's no match. So here we have set up the epitome of pride and the example of humility going head to head. The more we practice humility, the less of a stronghold pride will have. Then you will gain strength and destroy all the giants in your life. When you take on pride head first, then you will find that the rest of the areas in your life transform a lot easier and faster. Like I said, pride becomes a linchpin. You deal with that head on, you open the door for great spiritual transformation in your life. It says in 17, verse 50 through 53 in 1 Samuel, so David prevailed over the Philistine, over the giant, with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that the hero was dead, pride has been destroyed. When the hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharam road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. You too will gain possession of your life and God's promises for a more victorious life as you address your pride and develop spiritual maturity. Take it on head first. Cut it out of its head. And believe me, the spiritual transformation becomes a lot easier. Amen. Amen. I was sharing with a, with a friend today, and they were sharing, you know, I met with this, with this tax professional, and he was supposed to call me back about this, and he was supposed to do this, and they were supposed to do that. And you could see he was just upset. And the issue that they were dealing with wasn't that big of a deal. I go, you feel disrespected? Oh, yeah. Have you ever felt that way before? Oh, yeah. And you can see all the times in his life that he's been disrespected coming out of this one event. And he's coming there for legal advice, and I'm trying to talk to him, but you can't get through. 
And you could just see that pride had just blinded him and it just angered him. And that's what it does. And we can't see past it sometimes. And I told him, if you could see the pride issue and that God really set you up, he orchestrated this whole thing. And sure, we're going to have circumstances in life that you have to deal with. So, you know, sure, you've got a bit of a tax thing or a legal thing that you're going to deal with. But the bigger issue is look what God did for you. He's exposing how you've grown up feeling disrespected. And here you have it magnified before you. See the work that God is doing in your soul and in your heart first. He's doing you a favor. Don't, don't waste this pain. Don't waste this circumstance and not grow from it. Yeah. You missed the whole purpose of it. Amen. So yeah, deal with the circumstance, but see what's beneath it so that we have spiritual growth. So anytime you feel pain, you feel disrespected, you feel unloved, you feel that somebody's bringing you down, say, wait a second, is there a lesson in this for me? And just pull back. Don't be so quick to judge that person as having something against you. Amen. This issue of pride goes all the way back, right? We've seen it with God and Satan. God had a, you know, Satan wanted to take God's position and God cast him out. What happens to Satan? He's thrown into the lake of fire, right? Hell is made just for him. Adam and Eve, they wanted to be like God. They got cast out of the Garden of Eden. Peter was prideful. Thinking, I'll never let Jesus down. Falls asleep in the garden. I'll never deny Christ, Peter says. Denies him three times. We lift ourselves up. We get put down. But the most glaring example of pride in the New Testament is when Jesus is confronted with the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. So let's let's take a look at another area of pride and spiritual maturity as we look at Jesus Christ's interaction with the Pharisees. So those are two big examples that we have for tonight. David and Goliath as an illustration of pride versus humility. And then we're going to see it again with Jesus Christ as he puts up with and confronts the Pharisees. Now, some people need a clearer idea as to what we mean by pride sometimes. And there's two kinds of pride, really. Let me uh, read a little something to you guys. Selfish pride can be defined as excessive confidence or glorification of oneself, possessions, or a nation. In the Bible, along with pride itself, we see it in words such as arrogance, haughtiness, conceit, all of which are the opposite of godly humility. The wrongness of self-centered pride is essentially twofold. On a spiritual level, it inevitably leads to disregard, disrespect, and disobedience to God. Self-centered pride is primarily what transformed the once righteous Lucifer into the wicked Satan after he became too impressed with himself. I will make myself like the Most High, Isaiah. But we also see it on a worldly level. Selfish pride very often results in self-destructive behavior because while a form of self-delusion, it isn't necessarily as much of, of an overestimate, overestimate, overestimation of oneself as it is a dangerously low underestimation of others. Hence, pride goes before destruction and the heart of spirit before a fall. The Bible also speaks of a good pride, but it differs greatly from selfish pride. And there's a few examples of that. The Bible says, pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech I hate. For the sin of their mouths, the words of their lips, let them be trapped in their pride. For the wicked boast of the desire of his heart, and the man greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord in the pride of his countenance. The wicked does not seek him in Psalms. 
And God will humble those who don't humble themselves. Amen. There's so much scripture on this. A man's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. A good verse about the, the Bible speaks of a good form of pride. In 2 Corinthians, for example, says, We are not commending ourselves to you again, this is Paul speaking, but giving you cause to be proud of us, so that you may be able to answer those who pride themselves on man's position and not on his heart. So when you are happy for someone and you're on their side, you're not putting them down and lifting yourself up, that's a good form of pride. We see pride versus humility with David and Goliath. And look what happened to David. Or look what happened to Goliath. Despite his size and strength, he's cut down. And with Satan versus God, we see what happens to him. You know, it's better just be on, to be humble than be on God's side. And First Peter says, In the same way you who are younger, submit yourselves to your elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Because... God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Be on God's side, humility, and receive the favor of God. So let's look a little bit closer at, the, uh, at Jesus and the Pharisees now. These, Jesus and this group go at it throughout the Gospels. It's probably my, my, my favorite part of the Bible. He's constantly challenging them. Not, not so much their authority, but more about their heart and their attitudes and their actions. In Luke 18, 9, I'm going to use the New Living Translation. It kind of says it real clear. It's the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Then Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else, referring to the Pharisees. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood up by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat, I don't sin, I don't commit adultery. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed, Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you this, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Pride is always busy pointing the finger at somebody else, putting others down to feel good about itself. The Pharisees are so often showed walking the, walk the cities with their fine robes, thinking that they're so much better than everybody else, ringing bells when they make their tithes, making the long prayers. They act like they're better than everybody else. And they're always focusing on the outside, on the things that they have. And they don't see their own sinful hearts. Amen. Remember, it's not about what you're doing, but what you're becoming. It's what your character is about. Amen. You know, we try so hard to control our behavior and discipline how we, uh, how we act. We're so much more caught up with how others are going to perceive us. So we work about what image we're going to project. So you know what, that person is looking at me, so I'm going to do this good thing. You know, and then being a good Christian is all about work now. It's all about discipline. If I don't go to church today, then somebody's going to say something or know something, you know. <laughs> And it's all about the outside. It's all about being seen. It's all about how people are going to view me. If we work on our inner character, if we work on our pride, if we work on these spiritual issues, what naturally happens is that, you know what? We hunger for righteousness. We find ourselves doing good things. But it's because it's coming naturally from the inside. It's not something that's forced. Now it's no effort. A good example I used to use for uh, my health talks was like, instead of saying, I've got to discipline myself to eat good food. You know, I can't drink that and I can't eat that. You know, I've got to exercise. And it's just all discipline and strength. Willpower. 
And we all run out of willpower. None of us are, are, are enduring enough to do anything long in our own strength. But I used to teach, teach your, train your tongue in a different way. Train your mind to see food in a different way. Amen. When you see that cheeseburger versus you see that salad, don't say, oh, wow, I wish I could have that cheeseburger. My life is just so disappointing and not fair. You're going to eat that lame salad. It's so boring. <laughs> and that's how the Christian life ends up being for a lot of us. Yeah, I guess I'll do this because it's the right thing to do. But if you look at the cheeseburger and you say, wow, not only just the calories, right? But you see all the antibiotics in the meat. You see all the preservatives in it, all the sodium. You see that they put sugar even in the bun. Not sugar, high fructose corn syrup, and your body can't even digest that properly. You know, I see a cheeseburger. I see poison now. You know, I can't enjoy it. But it took me years to brainwash myself in the reverse way because they said, wow, cheeseburger changes your life. It's so much fun. You know what? You struggled all day today. You know what you need? You need a break. Where are you going to go? McDonald's. Because you deserve it. You deserve that toxic burger. See? It's filled with these toxins. And we're convinced that, oh, I'm doing myself a favor. I'm getting that ice cream sundae with all the artificial flavors and all the artificial colors and all the, all the, uh, Eagle Skins. Eagle Skins. <laughs> Beetle Skins. Yeah, and all the other crud that's in it. But as you train your mind and reverse the conditioning, you start to see the cheeseburger for something else. And then you look at your salad. Wow, the tomatoes have lycopene in it, the lettuce. <laughs> Good for the prostate, you know. You know, you put olive oil on your own, but you put lemon and antioxidant. So you put, you see, well, so now your brain looks at the salad and you've learned about what's in the salad that's good for you. You're like, wow, this stuff is great. This is good for me. So you take a bite of the salad and you say, thank you, God, this is good for me. Okay? I used to tell my clients, every sip of water you take, say, I love water, but I don't like water. Just say it. Okay, I will. They all would come back, oh, I love water now. <coughs> they recondition themselves to think more positively. Your taste buds, it gets addicted to the salt and the additives. In fact, they deliberately add these things so that you have this addiction. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked on a study on health. Why? Right. We need it. Someone presses. One in January, and go back and... <laughs> But there's a, a spiritual comparison, right? We learn to like good things. You know, we learn to change from the inside out right. for God to develop a character that, that, that approaches life from a humble point of view. Yes, you know, so it, you're not even trying to challenge the thoughts that go through your head that say, they're no good and I'm better. No. You know, don't, you never get that, go through your head, they're disrespecting me. And you hear this, they're like, wait a second. That's, that's coming from the enemy. I don't have to, I don't have to buy that thought. You know what? And I don't have to believe they think I'm less than them. In fact, I'm not going to believe that I'm less than them. God's word doesn't say that. No. So I'm going to disregard that. You know, in fact, that's sin. That's temptation from Satan. And if I believe that, am I falling to temptation and falling into sin by believing this negative, evil thing about this person, about myself? I think so. But as we change and we develop a character of humility... These ideas about others start to fade. Mm -hmm. And now you don't get offended by somebody. Okay. You know what? You say, ah, oh, wow. And I don't want to jump ahead of me, but this is when we get into more about Christ. He says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. You know what? They've been battered and beat up their whole life to feel like they're nothing. Right. And they're just feeling bad and acting that out. Or they're stressed out. They, weren't, they haven't learned any coping mechanisms. Mm -hmm. You know? Or, you know what? I'm just reading more into it than I have to. And that comes from humility. There's no effort to say, ah, oh, I'm just going to forgive them. I'm going to tough it up. And that's okay. You know, God, you know, you're, 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 you're my shield. And I'm going to, you don't have to go through that whole process. It just falls off you like Teflon. Humility is powerful. Hallelujah. From the inside out, it makes, it's, it's the linchpin. It makes spiritual growth and this walk on earth way easier. My peace was disturbed earlier today. 
and it restored. Yes. In Luke chapter 20, 45 through 47, it says, and here he is, you know, just bagging on the Pharisees, okay? I love it. Then in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who desire to go around in long robes, love greeting in the marketplaces, the best seats in the synagogues, and the best places at the feasts, who devour widows' houses, and for pretense, pretend, for pretense, make long prayers. These will receive greater condemnation. All about the show, it's all about the doing. And this pride, it blinds us. The pride, it blinds us. This is significant. It blinds us of our own sins and our responsibilities to grow as Christians. Even the leaders of Judaism were prone to this sin. So, whether it's Satan or David or Peter, it's a warning to us, to the church, to its leaders, that it's a dangerous thing to be blind to something. And pride will blind us of our own sin. Mm. We only see theirs. We can't see our own. Remember the illustration I gave you about the bricks? I remember, it's like, you know, you got this brick. It creates walls of separation. And all this pride. How do you see past that? Yeah. You got to stoop really low and go under that wall. You know, and that's humility. And you see the other side. Like, oh, I see things way differently when you're down there. Oh. Jesus condemned the Pharisees' self-righteous hypocrisy because it blinded them from seeing their need for repentance and change and Savior. In Matthew 23, 25, it says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and dish. Deal with your inside work that the outside of them may be clean also. See where Jesus says it begins? Deal the inner work. The pain you're feeling and the disrespect you're feeling is to deal with the inner work. It's Matthew what? I'm sorry. 23, 25. First clean the cup and the dish, and then the outside of them may be clean also. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Mm -hmm. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine Jesus coming down here to the church and saying, oh yeah, you guys look all nice and pretty on the outside, with your nice clothes and your big Bibles that are full of highlighting. But inside, what are you really feeling? I remember, let's make sure I have enough time before I go off on some of these things. Uh, somebody uh, listening to this thing or reading this thing, this uh, article, and it says, you know, a pastor at the end of a good service can be at the door greeting people goodbye, mm -hmm. having a cigarette. And I tell you, by the, by the next Sunday sermon, that board has him kicked out and a new preacher on, at the podium. But you take that same pastor who's got hardness in his heart, unforgiveness, judgment, criticizing people, not getting along with his wife, having division, and he'll be at that podium week after week after week. Yeah. That's not how Christ looks at it. Mm -hmm. And we need to train ourselves to think differently. Right. Yeah. Matthew 15, 14, let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. When we think we're better than someone else, we won't see our faults. We only see or perceive that we are good because we think we're better than them. Well, at least I'm better than them. All those horrible Springer shows, people love watching them because you see the, the lowest of mankind, right? And I make people feel good. At least I'm not that bad. Just a couple more verses. There's just so many good ones. We'll skip that one. But Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, Why do you reason because you, have, because you have no bread? 
Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your, start, is your heart still hardened? Teaching that your pride will harden your heart. Mm. And when your heart is hard, you perceive differently. You, you can't get the conviction of the Holy Spirit. It, it says in the Bible, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Pride says, brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye. But he can't see the plank in his own eye. Proverbs 14, 12. We think we know better. That is pride. There is a way that seems right to a man, it says, but its end is the way of death. Oh, I know better than God. Oh, let's just do it like this. I don't even want to consult him. <coughs> As we get to the last part, this is my favorite. Let's look at what we talked about, about Jesus versus the Pharisees. So we're going to look at, you know how we looked at Goliath, the epitome of pride, and David, an example of humility. Let's look at Jesus and look at the Pharisees. The Bible teaches that Jesus was equal with God. Okay, so Jesus has got a right to be prideful, right? Or he, he's up there already. He was at the right hand of God. That he never sinned. He put others before himself. He was loving and compassionate. He was a king. He could do miracles. He allowed himself to be tortured and crucified. It's humbling. He was humiliated. He was dressed in fake robes and mocked and spit on, insulted, stripped naked, and like a criminal nailed to a cross. So here we have one of the greatest people to ever, the greatest person to walk on this earth, who's got every reason to be full of pride, and he humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. Okay? So sometimes we lift ourselves up and say, oh, I shouldn't have been treated that way. Oh, I'm offended by how you looked at me or what you did or didn't do. Who are we compared to Christ? Amen. So we set ourselves up, but look. Look at our example in Christ. And the Pharisees, what did they do? Yet they held himself up in such high regard. In fact, Jesus says when he was getting arrested in the garden, and Peter uh, wanted to defend Jesus, you know, and you know the story of how he cut off somebody's ear. Jesus says to him, Do you think that I cannot pray to my Father and he will provide me with more than 12,000 legions, excuse me, with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures, the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen this way? So here Jesus is. He's on the cross, right? After they did all this to him. And he could summon a legion of angels. Okay? And I always thought legion was a thousand. So I, I looked it up and a legion was about 6,000 soldiers. Okay? And he says he can summon about a dozen. Alright? So do the math. 12 times 6,000 is about 72,000. Okay, so he could call 72,000 people. Why about all these people, Rome, Pharisees, everybody that's, you know, hurling these insults and, as he's on the cross. And then I read that somewhere in Isaiah 37, 36, it records a single angel wiping out 185,000 yes. men. Yes, so that's a lot of math. Yes. It comes out to... It's like one comma one one zero comma zero 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 one billion one hundred and ten million men it can wipe out or destroy. Yeah, what does Jesus do? He humbly submits himself to his Father's will, stays on that cross, completes his atoning sacrifice, and before he dies, commits his spirit to heaven and says these final words. One of the final words is, "Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do." They don't understand what they're doing. People who insult you, who are disrespectful to you, who hurt you. Think of somebody in your life that loves you. A wife, a son, a friend. And think of how many times you feel that they hurt you. Let that sink in for a second. We've all gone through that, right? 
I get an amen somewhere? Amen. And then say to yourself, does that person love me? You know they do. But immediately we interpret them as being mean or hurtful or disrespectful or something negative. But they love you. When you really think your husband is against your wife or your wife's against your husband, or that your parents are against your children, or the children don't love their parents, none of that's true. But do we think that at the moment? And then we get hurt and wounded and angry, and then we want to retaliate, or we want to separate and divide. This is the cause of pride. This is the sin of pride. It, it ruins our lives. It's the biggest troublemaker. Mm -hmm. We don't have to believe that lie. We don't have to believe that lie. Amen. It comes in, and it's bait. And you have a choice to set before you life and death, good and evil. I pray you choose life. So when you leave tonight, or even as you're sitting here, you're going to hear that voice that says, you're no good. She didn't say hi to you when you walked in. They didn't say goodbye to you. Somebody didn't greet you when you got home. An email, a text, something's going to irk you and, dist and dis disturb your peace. And you're going to have a choice at that very moment. Take a deep breath. Pause. Don't, go, don't be reactive. Don't be reactive, because that's just our flesh. That's just habit. That's just conditioning that we were trained that way. You know, we're, even our culture that we've been talking about in this world influences us to be that way. We see it in the TV shows. It's always reinforced to act that way. It's not true. It's ruining ourselves. It's ruining our lives in church. So you hear it, don't react and say, wait a second. He or she loves me. Okay. And there's no way I'm going to believe that that was meant for evil. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, my favorite verse in the Bible. It changed my life 15 years ago. Back then, Ralph, when I was teaching the Life of Christ class. So, was Jesus weak then, that he didn't send his legion of angels to wipe these people out? No. And just take it all? No. He was meek. In the Greek, it's an attitude of humble, submissive, and expectant trust in God, and a loving, patient, and gentle attitude towards others. My favorite or easiest definition is power under control. You know, we have a, a few more minutes. I'm going to read what I have to you about meekness, because I, I think it's relevant, because we can see the pride, and I can see that you guys see that, and what's the remedy to that? What's the solution? How do we get past that? And I believe the antidote is humility. And meekness is representative of humility. And Jesus is the best representative of humility. Meekness, it says, is not weakness. Sometimes we confuse the two. But the difference between meek, a meek person and a weak person is this. A weak person can't do anything. A meek person, on the other hand, can do something, but chooses not to. You could stand up, all right, we'll let this explain it. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The word meek, from the original language, was used to describe reigning in a stallion, okay, a horse. It's the idea of a horse being controlled by a bit and bridle. The horse is choosing to submit to authority. That's meekness. It's power under constraint. So we can train ourselves under the submission of God, knowing that God can wipe them out or that we could stand up to them. It's not being used as a doormat. Mm -hmm. Not at all. Although Jesus said, blessed are the meek, we don't celebrate meekness in our culture. Instead, we celebrate assertiveness. We celebrate getting things from other people. Sometimes <coughs> even taking advantage of other people. When is the last time you saw a movie that celebrated the virtue of meekness? When is the last time the big buildup for the movie was the moment when the good guy meekly restrains himself, even though he was wronged? We don't want to go to a movie like that. We want to see a payback movie, in which the first half consists of bad things happening to the hero, and the last half consists of bad things that come to the people who did those things to the hero. That's what's entertaining us. 
That is what our culture celebrates. How different this is than what the Bible teaches. The Bible celebrates meekness. The biblical worldview says, last is first, giving is receiving, dying is living, losing is finding, the least is the greatest. Meekness is strength. The idea that we are living by God's truth, not by what our culture says, should make us happy. In conclusion, if pride affects the Christian life and the development of spiritual growth so much that it blinds us to our own sins, then how can we ever grow in other areas without maturing in this area first? As we said, it's the linchpin to failure. And if that's so, if it's a linchpin to failure of great men, that it is also the key to our success. As much damage as it can cause, it's as much goodness and greatness it can be in your walk. Just like David, through the power of meekness, was able to cut down his giant, and they were able to plunder their enemies. So too, God, as you change from the inside out, will give you the strength, will open the door for you to make great strides in your spiritual development and make changes in all areas of your walk. Pride affects every area of our life. As we zero in on that, it opens the door to great spiritual development in your life. Choose humility over pride. Pray not only for humility, but pray first for an awareness of your pride. Because remember, pride blinds, so you don't see, you don't even notice that you're doing it. We're doing it every moment of every day. So, on our knees and say, God, show me my pride, and I promise you, you'll see it. And if that's an area you want to grow in, write it down. Start a pride journal, right? And as you know, get a little index card and put it in your car or your pocket, and every day you feel that, ah, Man, they irked me. It's like, ah, write it down. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, you'll see a pattern in your life. Oh, most of my emotional ups and downs, most of my loss of peace comes from the effects of pride in my life. Okay. Practice humility and see its mighty yet humble power displayed for you. Humility or meekness will unleash thousands of angels to help you on your spiritual journey and your personal and spiritual transformation. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. And it's just so rich in teaching us, God, that we cannot grow and change without the power of your Holy Spirit to make us aware of our own pride. From the very beginning, pride brought down the best of men. It brings us down in little pieces all the way throughout our lives, throughout history. Help us to see the Gospels, Lord God, as a lesson for us to learn. To see Jesus Christ as the great example of humility and meekness. Help us to practice humility in our lives. When we are faced with something this week, and we see our pride get in the way, I pray we choose life, that we choose humility. And this will empower us, God, and will restore our peace. And life and our spiritual growth become so much easier. We pray all these things now through the power of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If we could have the uh, ushers or someone come forward and... uh, We'll take up the offering. There's so much richness in the the scriptures. There's so many verses I wanted to share with you guys. Take some time out and and look at some of these verses. Reread John. Reread 
Samuel. I'm going to ask you guys, if you have a piece of paper or on the tithing thing, to please put a prayer request down. Anything. Anything so that I can pray, that we can pray for you as a church. I want to be able to have this basket by the next few weeks filled with your prayer requests. I had some more of these yellow sheets of paper on anything. Just write any prayer request. You don't have to put your name on. I don't care. I want to fill up this basket because you're going to put your issues here and you're going to say, okay, God, you're going to deal with it. And then we're going to pray. And if your name is not on it, we'll pass it back out one day. You guys can pray for each other. Is the, okay, the ushers are still coming? That's about as much time as I can buy. But anyway, I just thank you guys for showing and I pray uh, that God will continue to, to minister to this church and to us. Amen.
looked at his side, and there was no reaction out of him. There was only blood and water that came out. So when people poke at us, you know, when they make fun of us, and, or whatever the case may be, you fill in the blank, there's to be no reaction out of us. Okay. And all that comes out is blood and water, uh, sim symbolic of you know, the blood of Jesus and, and the word. So instead of reacting in the flesh, we react in love. Jesus loved us and he died for us. So what a perfect example of the cross. And uh, man, it's just amazing. Father God, we come before you. And uh, I just pray that you would just strengthen us, Father God, that you would just bless the rest of our week, that you would just fill us with your spirit, Father God, that you would just uh, strengthen us Help us to walk in the Spirit, not react in the flesh, Father God. Reveal, reveal to us, Father, the areas that uh, we need. I mean, there's a lot of areas that we need working, Father, but the areas that you would have us to, to submit to you fully, Father God. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for what you've done on the cross. And help us to walk victorious in, in you, Lord. Uh, in your name, Lord Jesus, we give you thanks. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.